Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. It's time for Sunday school. Good morning. Glad to see all of you virtual and in person. The eighth Psalm, the first verse reads, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Thanking God for his holy word and moving on into our Sunday school this morning. This is the fourth Sunday, the last quarter, the last lesson of this quarter. We're moving out of the summer into the fall. We'd like to uh, have our opening prayer this morning by Sister Pat Grimsley, and then we're going to turn it right over to our lead teacher this morning, Sister Sophia Powell. Good morning, Sunday School. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Amen. We lift our hands in the sanctuary. We lift our hands to give you the glory. We lift our hands to give you the praise. And we will praise you for the rest of our day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity to gather for Sunday school to learn of you, and to grow in your word. Father, we thank you for St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church. We thank you for all of the officers and members. Father, help our Sunday school to grow because there is much to learn of you. There is also a lot for us to take into the street and do what you have called us to do, call others to you. Father, again, I thank you for this day. I thank you for blessing each and every one of us. Be with us as we go throughout this day and throughout this week. Take care of us and let us live in your blood and be grateful for all the things that you have done for us. For it is in Jesus' name I ask this prayer. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. To those who are present and to those who are remote, we welcome you this morning to our final lesson in our quarter for Sunday school. Usually I like to start with just a short prayer. Thank you, Sister Pat, for that beautiful, beautiful prayer. It is so fitting um, that Sister Pat prayed and mentioned about the lesson and so that we may take a part of that lesson because this is what Sunday school is about, is coming in to further our education about God, the person that we serve, the person that allows us to be here on this earth, gives us breath. He is everything to us. So it's so fitting that we'd wanna know as much as we can about him so that we can share with others. Most gracious and merciful Father, we thank you this morning for allowing us to be in your presence once more. God, we ask that this lesson go forth. God, I pray that you will decrease me this morning and increasing me, God, so that your will will be done and not mine. God, I ask that this lesson, not just for the hearers, God, but that your words may be utilized in the way that you would have it. Lord, so that we may take your word and spread it. As Jesus said in Matthew 28, 28, go we therefore and spread the word, God, that we will do the same. God, we thank you this morning. We ask that your word and your will be done. In Jesus' name, I humbly submit this prayer and ask all things, amen. So our final lesson, Miracles on Malta. In the beginning of the book, there is a section on page two about looking ahead. This particular section gives you an overview prior to going into the book, but I found it very fitting since this is the very last lesson to do a recap. And this will give you a recap um, of what took place and just a little nugget of what is to come in this lesson. God demonstrates his power and authority in a number of ways, through his creation, through his word, through his people. In the scriptures, we see a number of examples of godly men and women glorifying the Lord through steadfast ministries, prophecies, 
on his behalf and even miraculous healing. In unit one of our quarter, we specifically looked at faithful servants. We see some big names like Samuel, who was dedicated to God's service of his entire life, for his entire life, and Isaiah, a prophet whose ministry was fueled by supernatural knowledge of God's holiness. We also learn from lesser known servants. We observe how the psalmist Asaph remains faithful even when he sees the wicked prosper. And we see how God used many types of godly servants to rebuild his temple and restore the worship of his people. In unit two, we looked at ministries of the prophecies of the prophets while we examined difficult message of repentance and rebuke that Haggai and Micah were commanded to deliver to God's people. We find messages of hope through Habakkuk and the deliver and to deliver to God's people, we find messages of hope through Habakkuk and Ezekiel. Both showed God's people that he is faithful to fulfill his promises, even in the midst of suffering. The first two lessons of our last unit, which is on healers, shows us God's most faithful servant, his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus performed healings on earth to show the power of God's heavenly kingdom and to give weight to the gospel message. We see that he accepted anyone who approached him in faith. The last three lessons of our quarter focus on the church after Christ's ascension. God also used his followers to perform healings, to bolster the gospel message, bringing a variety of believers into his family. In these three lessons, God uses his servants to restore a lame man who was rejected by society, convert a Pharisee who was persecuting the church, and reveal God's glory to the whole tribe on Malta. Faithful ministry, prophecy, and healing all contributed to the growth of the gospel message. Though these lessons, through these lessons, we can see that God can use any means, humble or dramatic, to display his glory. However, he almost always uses one particular tool, his people. Learn to serve him faithfully today and he will use you for his glory too. That very last paragraph and the last sentence, learn to serve him faithfully today and he will use you for his glory too. That is very important. So that is mostly what we do in Sunday school. We're learning how to serve him through the history of how God works. Today's lesson, Miracles on Malta, our lesson text is taken from Acts 28, 1 through 10, related scriptures, Acts 27, 1 through 44. The time is AD 59 or 60, place Malta. Our golden text this morning, Acts 28 and 8, and it reads, Paul entered and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. On page 178, under preparing to teach the lesson, we have been looking at how God brought healing through Jesus and some of his servants. This week, we see how God used Paul and his faith. Today's aim, facts, to show the events that took place on Malta and how God worked healings through faith. Principle, to teach that God answers the prayer of faith. Application, to encourage faith in God who has promised to answer our prayers when we put our trust in him. The introduction on the same page, many of us struggle with the concept of faith. Through the years, 
we have adopted many erroneous ideas because of things we had heard growing up. Is that right? Many of us still repeat things we hear growing up without knowing the meaning of it. We should be looking at what the Bible says about this great concept of faith. Simply put, it is an implicit trust that God will perform what he said he will do in his word. This week, we see the results of Paul trusting God on the island of Malta, where he and his companions were shipwrecked. Paul continued to serve others through faith. We'll go back to page, to the lesson for this week. Did someone read the introduction on page 173, Mike? Oh, 173, right? Yes. As Christians, we get used to serving Christ in the ordinary routines of life. If we are serious about our walk with him, we thank him for daily necessities, read the Bible regularly, and worship often with his people. We also instruct our family families in his ways, try to glorify him at work, and seek opportunities to share our faith with others. But there are times when our routines are disrupted, and we find ourselves in situations in which our usual spiritual habits do not seem to fit. We may be on a vacation in an unfamiliar country or with an unusual schedule. We may be in the hospital for surgery or recuperating from being at home. But the experience of the Apostle Paul teaches us that the Lord opens doors of service even when things are not normal. In fact, it can be argued that Paul never had the luxury of a normal life. His witness took him through very disruptive experiences, including beatings, riots, imprisonment, and shipwrecks. In this week's lesson, we find him on a foreign island among unfamiliar people. Yet even there, God opened opportunities for him to minister. Thank you, Sister Pat. Do we have more mics out? No? Okay. Okay. Lesson outline, hospitality extended, Acts 28, 1 and 2. A miracle observed, Acts 28, 3 through 6. And miracles performed. Acts 28, 7 through 10. And we'll do our verse by verse. Our first one is the location, Acts 28 and 1. Would someone like to read that? And when they were escaped, they knew that the island was called Myrta. Thank you, Sister Wilma. Paul, who has been taken to Rome to appeal to the emperor the case the Jews had brought against him was on a ship that had been driven by a storm and grounded on an island. Only after the travelers went to shore did they learn that the island was Melita, today called Malta. Though the sailors had probably landed at the main port, Valletta, many times they had not recognized the spot on the eastern coast where they ran aground. The island's name comes from the Phoenician Canaanite word for refuge and was so named by the Phoenician sailors who had colonized it about a thousand AC. Oh, BC, thank you. It is a small island about 18 miles long and 18 eight miles wide, located about 60 miles south of Sicily. It was at one time part of Carthage's empire, but the, Roman, the Romans captured it in 218 BC. They gave it considerably independence, but appointed a supervising officer. So this first part just gives you an overview where Paul was, what he was doing, and what happened, what transpired, 
how did he get to this island? And why was he there? We're gonna dig into why he was there because we may think just by reading the story ahead of time, oh, okay, it happens. Shipwreck, you're on a ship. It's possible for a storm, you know, but we don't look as Christians, we look deeper into the story, the history of the story because God has his hands on everything we do. Everything that we do, there is a purpose. We were purposefully made. So nothing that we do and any chances, people say, oh, I met this person. Oh, it was a chance that I met her. I didn't plan to go to the store. It was not a chance. It was purposed by God. The storm, the ship, the shipwreck, it was purposed by God. God had a plan. And sometimes we grow weary. What's going on? What's going on? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? And we don't know what the outcome is. But through faith, if we wait on God, sometimes maybe not in this life, maybe we don't know. But the evidence will be there of why God did something. Okay. And that beginning is just about the location. We'll move into um, the reception, Acts 28 and 2. I'll have someone read that scripture, verse 2. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us, everyone because of the present rain and because of the cold. Thank you, Sister Stubb. Luke recorded that the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. Let's answer question one. What did the Greeks and Romans mean when they referred to others as barbarous people? Uh, that's on page 174. Right there in that first paragraph. Barbarous people translated barbarians in verse four does not mean savage or cruel persons. It was used by the Greeks and later the Romans to describe people who were not of themselves, specifically those who spoke with unintelligible sounds. Thank you, Sister Pat. So many times we see a certain person, we, we have a certain name that we call people. They're indigent people. Um, they're people that are obviously poor, homeless, live on the streets. This is a word that describes not necessarily savages, but people who spoke a different language. Because sometimes we refer to people that are immigrants differently, sometimes not out of um, trying to make them feel bad, but sometimes to identify them. Um, but we notice one thing about these people. They were kind. Beyond normal kindness, exceptionally kind, exceptionally accommodating. And as we see with Pharaoh, we see with the Israelites, God can use anyone. They might have been barbarians, pagans, not of a certain faith, but they were exceptionally kind. And that is not of their own doing. This is God setting a stage for Paul, for everything that he has planned is perfectly done. No matter who you think, or what you think of someone else, God can use that person. This is the second paragraph under the reception. They proved to be hospitable to the stranded travelers. The islanders demonstrated no small degree of kindness an understated way of saying their kindness 
was extraordinary. Let's answer question two. Question two. They built a fire and welcomed every one of the castaways. It must have been a sizable fire, for there were 276 travelers, and all of them were accommodated. Thank you. Oh my goodness. So it wasn't five people, wasn't just Paul. There were 200 and can you imagine? Someone has a little fender bender in front of your house, a bus. <laughs> and they are closest, there's no one else around. It's your house. How would you feel? Yeah. Would you worry? Yeah. If you could feed them? Obviously they were hungry, mm -hmm. probably wet. There was a storm shipwrecked, meaning they probably took under some water, their things are wet, can't go down to the bottom of the ship to find food. What would your thoughts be? Hmm. You'd probably go crazy. <laughs> I don't have enough food. Why is this happening to me today? <laughs> hmm. And they probably look a little bit, you know, what we call raggedy not in their best clothes because they haven't yet gotten to their destination. So they probably were dressed a certain way, you know, to do the work on the ship. Uh, God is not respected person. We, we study that all the time. When, when they came to this island, when they came to this island, these people might have got excited themselves. We don't think that way. We're not thinking that way, but they got excited. And I'm looking at the fire as a bonfire. See, y'all, y'all don't know much about bonfires because y'all ain't y'all ain't been around no. But when the youth center back in the days during baseball season, we used to have a bonfire. And we had a bonfire so everybody could be around the fire. Mm -hmm. And it and it accommodate everybody. And with this bonfire, they probably had some food. I'm I'm, I'm saying they, they was cooking something or whatever, but they was having a, a good time. And that was all by the grace of God. Thank you. Mr. Pat, you asked us what would we do? We run and call 911 today and we peek through the window. We probably wouldn't even go out there until after 911 arrived so we could see what was going on. But I don't see us rushing out to help right away. Isn't that the truth? Oh, and that is absolutely not the right thing to do. As believers, we are supposed to be open to everyone. We are the arms and legs of Jesus Christ. Your first thought should be, I know it sounds like a cliche, what would Jesus do? Hmm. Not what would I do or what I cannot do. But if the shoe was on the other foot, we would want someone to run to our rescue, right? How dare she peep through her window? I know she see me. You know, we should always be ready to help. That is why we're here. We are not here for ourselves. We do not belong to ourselves. It was a price that was paid. Jesus paid the, the price. Mm -hmm. Of course, we cannot repay him. Mm. But our first thought should be, what can I do to help? You hear of heroes. You hear of their stories, normal people. Like the... Maltesians rushing to help people without thinking, pagans, not believers, rushing out, jumping into a river, rescuing people from an overturned boat, car on fire, 
damping their clothing and covering themselves and rushing into fire without thinking. Most of us analyze, am I gonna get burned? We've never, never doubted our abilities to swim, but this one time we did, because somebody jumped in the river. Instead of putting your trust in God. Praise God. Trust first. When you say you trust someone, you can hand them your house key and say, I'll be back. When you're out, you're not thinking, oh, wonder if they're going through my stuff. No, you trust them. You don't care that they're there because you're not thinking, this is someone I trust, right? So how is it that our trust in God is minimal? God, I'm gonna trust you to get me this house. But I'm not gonna trust that you're gonna keep me safe because I'm helping John out of the river. Because this is effort on your part. But when you want something, you trust God. So easy to trust him when you want. But we don't trust him when we're giving. We get our paychecks. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going. We do everything under the sun with our paychecks. Lord. It won't be enough. Can't tithe today. Won't be able to pay the light bill. How about paying your tithes and trusting that God's going to take care of it? There is work that comes with that, though. Being good stewards over your finances. Not buying the dress because, you know... Somebody else has one and it's cute. Mm. Knowing that you can't pay the light bill. Mm. Leave the dress. Pay your tithes. Trust God to provide the rest. All right, let's move on. The other thing that yes, we do, Sister, Sister Sophia, we'll try everything else before. And then God, our last resort instead of our first amen god should not be our last resort why do we like to do things the hard way it's the hardest way to call everybody on the phone when we have a need you have no food set the table trust god don't call everybody telling them your business i don't have no money we starving Tell God, set the table, wait on God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 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 That's correct. That's correct. 
Amen. Thank you. This is Thompson. Mm. Mm. Amen. And that's correct. We have to cut away from those habits. And then we wonder why our prayers haven't been answered. You don't want to be the last resort. Why do you think God wants to be the last resort? You think he's pleased that you consulted other people before you consulted him? He is not pleased. You say he's your everything. We sing. We stop. God is my everything. How much of that do you believe? Hmm. In your actions. Faith is not saying I believe. It is an action word. It requires action. Doing. People say, how can you say you love me and you never showed it to me? We have to exercise our faith. It's not enough to just say, oh, I trust God and I'm faithful. And when adversities come, you cry, you fall on the floor, you tell everybody your business first. And then when no one can help you, Father God, help me. Amen. We go to God first because what? He is our everything. You want a stranger to walk up and say, you know, I saw you the other day and it was laid on my spirit to hand you this envelope. How's that going to happen if you didn't talk to God first? Hmm. You want someone you've never seen or haven't seen in a long time to ring your doorbell and go, you know, you were on my mind. Have a little something for you. How's that going to happen? You didn't tell God. Mm -hmm. You didn't act like you needed him. Because you got this covered. Got all the phone numbers in your phone book. You know who to call. You know who have what. They can help me. No. Show God that he is your everything. That you trust him. As this story unfolds, we see that sometimes even unbelievers act better than believers. They were very welcoming to Paul. 276 people. It's like they were waiting for someone. Mm. A bonfire. That is an inviting thing, right? You can see a bonfire from a long ways off. You look, you're wondering what it is. You probably walk over to see what's going on. It was like they were waiting. This is how God set the stage for something to happen. He has created a storm. He has prepared an island, prepared a people pagan people, not believing people. Sophia, Go ahead. God always has the right people mm -hmm. in the right place at the right time. Amen. Amen. God always have the right people, the right place at the right time. Mm. How about that? Let's move on. A miracle observed. Paul's snake bite, Acts 28 and three. Could someone read the third scripture? And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Amen. Whoa. Paul cannot catch a break. 
sure that's what most of us is thinking. Imprisoned, put on a ship, shipwrecked, snake bite. We would have been over it. Carrying on about what's going on, can't catch a break. We would have been over that. What else, Lord? But as we are going to see, that has no bearing on Paul's faith. Doesn't change that Paul is fully believing in God and trusting him for whatever is to come. A songwriter writes, having one of these days, you know, you know which day I'm talking about. And somebody say, how you doing, sister? Oh, I'm having one of these days. You know exactly before she opens her mouth what she's talking about. The day where anything that can go wrong goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And you're like expecting anything else because it's already gone wrong. It's going wrong. But look at Paul. Look at Paul. Are we trusting in God on a day when anything can go wrong? That could go wrong. Paul is shipwrecked, imprisoned, snake bite. Just a minute. Amen. Paul welcomed that. Yeah, and Paul welcomed it because he knew if we can study God's word, understand his promises, and trust in his word, the Bible says he will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. So no matter what you're going through, God is still there. He's still in control. He is allowing this. You don't have to know everything. He cannot tell you everything. We cannot handle everything. We'll run around trying to change stuff. Well, God told me that, you know, tomorrow this is going to happen. I'm not even going down there because I'm not going to be in. We're going to try to change the direction that God is leading us to. And that is why he doesn't tell us everything. Scripture says he has secrets. Things we cannot handle. When we continue, as we continue the story, today's lesson, we continue in today's lesson, we're going to find that the snake, uh, snake snake bite or gun. God will use this as a tool to the for brain. And as we go further, we'll see that. Yeah. So sometimes God uses bad things for good. Yeah. So we have to be careful what we call bad mm -hmm. We know the story of Joseph. Praise. <laughs> oh. Praise God. Praise God. You see, oh. 
we are not trusting the process. We say to our young people, we live in a microwave time. Right now, right? They want everything right now. We do the same thing. We have no patience. We cannot wait right now, today. Next week, John, I'm gonna go get it today. God, if we trust God's design. Oh, how, you ask? Yeah. How do you know his design? It's in his word. It's not a secret. Throughout the entire history of the Bible, we have been so blessed that we have this entire book. Moses didn't have that. He had five. Five. Five that we probably don't even read now. Old Testament. That is the history of God revealing what he can do. And he's still doing, if you look at the history of the Bible and your life, can you tell me that they're not one and the same? They had trust issues. And he revealed that to them. We have trust issues. Is he revealing it to you? Nothing is coincidence. Everything is on purpose. It's God's design. That is why we are believers. We don't just believe some of his word when it applies to our situation. We believe all of it. Some of it is indifference to us because we're like, how can God be the God of love and do this here. Everything is according to God's plan. Setting the stage for Paul to show his goodness for his glory. Oftentimes we question God, we question ourselves, wondering what lesson or what good can come from such adversity. But as Christians, we should know by now, now, no matter how bad it gets, God is in charge. This is probably his way of preparing the way for his next big miracle. See that? Look at Paul. A miracle that, look at that, might involve us. We don't want to be a part of a miracle. I want to be a part of a miracle. I want to be in the middle. Whatever God is doing, I want to be in the middle. That is where we should want to be. No matter what adversity comes, we should want to be wherever God instructs us to be. Faith is not just a word. It's an exercise. Something we have to get up and do every day. Exercise faith. You've heard that. Not I'm a believer and then call it a day. Exercise faith. Let's move on to the people's interpretation. Acts 28 and 4. Could someone read that scripture?
Thank you. Huh. Wow. Powerful. Powerful. Let's answer question three. Why did the people first think Paul was a murderer? Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> the Greek word here often means justice, and sometimes it was personified to mean an act. Personified, thank you, Sister Pat, to mean an actual goddess who punished the guilty. Thus, the islanders may have been referring to this deity, or perhaps they were simply personifying divine retribution. In either case, they expected Paul to die shortly. They expected Paul to die. That's what we think, huh? That's what we would think. A change of opinion. Let's move on to five and six. Someone read verses five and six. And felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen, fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a God. Mm. Mm -mm. Thank you. Woo! How many of us would think? Oh, he might be a God, a prophet. Yeah, back in the day, they would say, oh, she's a witch. How could she not have died or he not have died? Yeah. But this is God. In the world that we live, a world of believers, nothing should come by surprise for us. It shouldn't surprise us like it surprised the pagans. Scientists says the world came about in the Big Bang Theory. Atoms came together, exploded, and here comes the universe. We evolved from something not human to this form. I often ask some of my classmates, so why, why did evolution stop? In all my years, I haven't seen any change in the human form. If we're still evolving, how comes our ears aren't longer? Eyes aren't bigger, you know, nothing's changing. The times have changed. The things we do in the world, technology, electronics, sure. Does, not, does that not tell the scientists that they had it wrong? Do you think they'd go back and say, oh, we had it wrong this whole time? This book, the Bible makes sense course not. They won't pop to that. Money-making deal. We are not evolving physically. We are evolving spiritually as we learn about God and we grow in his word. As we go out and spread the word of God, we are evolving. The kingdom of God is getting bigger. We have more believers. That is the only evolution. We are adding souls daily to the kingdom of God. 
by spreading his word, spreading his love, being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That is the evolution that I see. The Lord chooses many different methods to bear witness to himself in a sinful world and assure his own people of his direction. He had reassured Paul and displayed his power to those with by preserving their lives and bringing them safely to shore. That's number one. Now God was reassuring Paul again that he would safely reach Rome and he was manifesting his power to both islanders and voyagers to incite saving faith in them. That is a sure deal, a miracle, isn't it? It's a sure deal to gather souls, to show what God can do. It wasn't about what Paul did. Paul didn't do anything with that snake. He flashed it off. Like we would, hysterically. But what the people saw was different. How they interpreted the situation was different. Of course, they were, so, you know, superstitious. Because they didn't know God. They believe in gods, probably witches, you know, medicine men. They didn't know that this was God. So they waited for him to just fall dead. And when he didn't, there were more stirs. But God is coming through, isn't he? He's coming through. Let's answer number four. Why did they soon afterward concluded he was a God? Thank you. Right below where Sister Thompson read the next paragraph, it talks about similar events that had occurred earlier in Paul's ministry. Take some time and go through those. If you think you've been through something or been through anything, Look at the history of Paul's life. You can open the Bible and find on any page adversity at its greatest. Nothing we face, nothing at all. And Paul is still here for it because of what? His faith. He displayed his faith. He didn't just speak his faith. He acted on faith. Let's move on to the healing of Publius father. Acts 28, 7 and 8. Someone read.
Thank you. So Publius is sort of, you know, the godfather, the king here, the person over everything. So he's able to do much more than just a single person can do. He was very accommodating to Paul. But this is no coincidence. Again, nothing in God's plan is a coincidence. Let's go to question five. What did Publius do for the voyagers? At the bottom of page 176, Publius wrote Luke, received us, enlarged us three days courteously. He gave the shipwrecked survivors a gracious reception. Us probably refers to the entire group. Though this was a large number of people, Publius apparently had sufficient accommodations for all. Thank you. We're gonna answer question six, but as you see this unfold, it's talking about who he is. Now we're gonna move into why he's really there. Can someone, um, question six, <clears throat> what, ex what expected benefit did Publius hospitality have for him? Okay, that's on the uh, right column, Tom. Publius hospitality brought him an unexpected reward, the healing of his father. Thank you. So he, he had an issue. He had an adversity. His father was sick. Imprisoned, shipwrecked, snake bite, to welcoming arms, hospitable people. Now, God is opening the door some more. So as you follow God, it may not be all roses and beautiful things on the way. You may have to go through the valley, climb a few hills, but there is something there for you. You're not just wandering aimlessly. Trust God that even if there's not a box that's gift wrapped for you, trust him that this is his purpose and his plan and that he has a greater plan that you are going to be a part of. God was allowing Paul to share the gospel through um, this particular incident. It was a bad thing, but God turned it around uh, for good because once he was bitten and they expect him to die and he didn't, they automatically went back to those beliefs that they had, oh, this must be a God. But then Paul got the opportunity to explain no. This is my God and to bring the gospel to them. So God used adversities also to bring people to him. Exactly. Yeah. Maybe. Many times we suffer adversities. And our first question is, why me, Lord? I've been going to Sunday school. I've been doing what you told me to do. You promised to take care of me. This is the person that I love the most and you took him or her away from me. Is there any way that whatever door God has opened for you, it is not a shared experience? It is for you? Can you wrap your mind around that? Is there any way that what God has for you and is leading you to there's only enough room for you to go through that door. Have faith. We have to remember that we also live in a sinful world. And a lot of the things that happen 
Remember, he allows the rain to shine on, to come on the just and the unjust. So if it happens to Jane and Jane's a pagan or an unbeliever, it can happen to you too. This setup that we're working towards is not for life here and now. It's like going to school. If you don't go, oh, you can be a doctor, but nobody's coming. You can put your name on the door. You can open office. You've never been to school. No one will come. This is a process where we take in all the knowledge, all the education. We spread it around. We do what the lesson says. We trust God. We spread his word. We love others. We take care of those that are in need. Not because we want a crown, but we do this because we are instructed to do this by God. This is how we're supposed to live our lives. Trust God. Paul is trusting through all this adversity. Paul could have sat there with a snake bite. Of course he didn't die, but in human flesh, you may be thinking, oh, it, it, it might've hurt. You know, he got bit. Jesus felt pain. Paul could have been feeling pain. We would have sat and go, oh, put a bandage on it. I'm not going out to Bible study today. I got bit. I think I have a fever. Paul kept on going because Paul knew that God was still in control. We have to trust God in the process, no matter what. Can't all be cushy all the time. Adversity builds character. No, it sounds like a cliche, and I'm coming with another one. Diamonds aren't harvested and worn around your neck. It takes a lot to make them beautiful. God is trying to carve you and shape you. And all he asks is that you trust him in the process, exclusively trust him in the process. Okay, we're moving on. The healing of others, Acts 28 and nine. Others were healed. Everybody heard about it now. Everybody heard. Everybody's coming. Just like the beginning of Jesus's ministry, when everybody started hearing about him, Everybody was perplexed. Who's this man? Why is he doing that? And then when he started to work miracles, everybody came. Everybody wanted a miracle. Trust God in the process. Let's go to question eight. Why did the islanders go to Paul? to be healed and not he to them. Thank you. I wondered if he was talking about 
the other time Paul was in prison because I didn't remember them putting him in prison on the island. So remember when he was in um, prison and the people couldn't come to him. And then he put the commentator put this statement in here as a prisoner, Paul was unable to go to them. I'm thinking he talking, he's talking about it, the earlier time when Paul was in prison and not this incident. This incident, Paul was in transport to Rome. Right. To, as, as a, a prisoner. prisoner. Right, right. And it was shipwrecked right. prior to him arriving to Rome. Okay. So obviously there was some sign that, that he, was he was a prisoner. Okay. He may have had maybe a shackle or, or a sign or something on him that said that he was a prisoner. So of course, no guard would want you to roam around an island without security. So maybe they had people come to him so that he doesn't get to go off as a free man. All right. Yes, and it also <clears throat> allowed Paul to uh, pick up the, uh, the bunk wood and stuff, put on the fire. They allowed him to do that. The guys that were taking him to Rome, they let him work. Right. And, and that tells you that he might have been instructed or as a part of his job on the ship, as a prisoner, you, he worked. So naturally when he got to the island, he felt that this was work. So he fell right into his place as a prisoner to pick up wood and to help out. Thank you, Sister Pat, that's a good one. Uh, let's get question nine. Why is it safe to surmise that Paul's ministry on Malta included more than just healing? Thank you. We must also avoid the conclusion that miracles will always accompany the preaching of the gospel. The book of Acts does indeed record many miracles, but these were necessary to accredit Christ's message in a strongly pagan environment. The decline of miracles in later times need not mean a decline in the church. It means simply that God sovereignly uses or withhold miracles to suit his purpose. So not all the time that miracles are done, we should expect preaching or the message. God strongly, in God's sovereignty, he withholds miracles to suit his purpose purposes. That is why it's important to learn about how God does things. We must not expect things to fall into routine. He's not a routine God. It's not a Monday to Friday, do this, Saturday and Sunday, this is what we're doing. God's purpose does not change in his word, but it does not go for me the same thing that goes for Sister Pat. We are all living our lives separately outside. Different adversities, different situations. Now, um, I think the, the common thing makes it clear that just because we are not doing as many miracles doesn't mean that God can't or that he won't. You know, it's just, and now uh, with science and how God has let us grow and learn and evolve, many things can be answered logically that earlier could not be. And I think that's a part of why we don't say miracles as often as we used to. Absolutely. They are answers now because we have the entire Bible as well. Before they did not have it, as I mentioned earlier, Moses had five, just the first five. Jesus came and opened up a whole new world for us to gather information from. The Islanders uh, gratitude, let's finish up 28 and 10. 
you also honor us with many honors. If you be pardoned, they led us to such They made it up to such things as were necessary. Thank you. Let's answer 10. How did the Maltese show their thanks when the travelers left? Maltese showed the travelers with many honors. We do not know what form these honors took, but it was surely means they continue, continues to give them lavish hospitality for the rest of their stay. Thank you. In conclusion, Often we do not understand what God is doing in our lives. But there we see, but here we see that many others, seeing the mirac miraculous healing of Publius's father, brought their sick to Paul. They also were cured. God extended Paul's healing ministry to others on the island so that they could see the work of his, of his God among them. The islanders were thrilled. They honored Paul and his companions and gave them all that they needed for the rest of their journey. This was God's way of providing for all of them. So God's provision did not only come from believers, but God can use anyone. He can use anyone. Trust God. Follow the scripture, live your trust, your faith. Do not say I believe and we cannot see the fruit of your faith. Trust God. Thank you all for your time. We've run way over time. <laughs> I'm glad we got some questions in and some answers. Thank you all again for allowing me to present this lesson. Excellent job. Thank you, Sister Sophia. One more time, showing some appreciation for Sister Sophia being so thorough with our lesson this morning. Next, uh, that's the end of another book, St. Paul Sunday School. Made it through another quarter. We look forward to next quarter is learning to honor God through obedience. And Brother Marco Young is going to kick off our new uh, quarter next week. So we look forward to that. Thanking God for all of you here, a full house inside, and thanking those that are participating with us virtually. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move to close so that we can have our break before we start our 1030 service. If I could ask uh, Reverend Goff to come up and give an invitation to discipleship, please. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We have had a, <clears throat> a dynamic uh, uh, teaching this morning. All of our teachers are dynamic. But I'm hoping that somebody here today uh, <clears throat> might have uh, their doubts about God. Now, <clears throat> she said all we got to do is trust him. And that's it. Put your trust in him. That means we got to put ourselves aside and let God come in. And when he come in, he's going he's gonna to work if you let him work. Uh, the doors of the church is open. You can come by letter, come by Christian experience, or you can come for baptism. The doors of the church is open. <clears throat> Invitation, invitation is free, is free. He will save you.
Thank you, Reverend Goff. Um, collecting old Sunday school books. If you choose to turn yours in, we can uh, turn them over to the Turning Points Homeless Facility. So there's a bag here if you'd like to put your Sunday school books there. We close with St. Paul's mission statement, the Lord's Prayer, and then our Sunday school benediction. St. Paul's mission statement, exalt the name of Jesus, evangelize the world, equip the saints, encourage the saints, and edify the body of Christ. The Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And our Sunday school benediction. We have come, we have studied, and we have learned. So until our next coming together to study God's word, may his rich blessing and may his grace be eternally yours in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you again for participating. We're looking forward to.